Thank you. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. Hi. Um, ich sage, dass ich, ich bin eigentliches Entwickler. Uh, ich trage die Anzug, weil ich uh, zum uh, Oracle arbeitet. So, das ist okay. Und uh, ich will heute Abend auf Englisch reden, aber during die Frage und Antwort, ich kann ein bisschen Deutsch verstehen und sprechen. Und uh, wenn Sie Fragen haben, nun ist es nicht so einfach, auf Englisch zu fragen, sondern Sie können auf uh, Deutsch fragen und ich antworte auf Englisch meistens. So. I wish I could hurt this not breathing thing. That's, can you bring it up a little so I can move it further away? Because I'm tired of hearing myself breathing. Is that better? Yeah. Mm. Nicht atmet, bitte. Ich muss atmen. Hold on, okay. I guess that's a little better. All right. Well, I'm very happy to be here in uh, Berlin. I was here last year just for a little bit after the uh, DOAG conference, uh, and that's where I'm going tomorrow, to uh, Nuremberg. Anyone here know about DOAG? DOAG conference, Deutsche Orger Anwendergruppe. Very big conference in Nuremberg, and uh, I'm presenting about JSF there as well. And uh, there's another conference that's organized by the same people that do DOAG uh, called Javaland. Has anyone heard of Javaland? Javaland.eu. And uh, if you check that out, unfortunately, the, uh, you know, they had so many submissions, and uh, they're focusing on German, so I think they, they must have not assumed I could talk in German. So they didn't take any of my sessions, unfortunately. But I still recommend Javaland. I think it's a, a good conference if you get a chance to check it out. So yesterday, I had some time, and I went to the uh, Computerspiel Museum. And I saw this thing here, uh, the Pain Station. This is a very funny thing, and I, 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 I think nie in Deutschland und auch typisch Deutsch, weil man muss die Hand dann und uh, die Peit kommt. Und, uh, so I was thinking about, some people complain about JSF as, as lots of pain, so I'm hoping that JSF is not a pain station, even though uh, we have a pain station here at the Computerspiel Museum. Okay, here is what I would like to, uh, how I would like to spend your time tonight. Um, HTML5, right? Um, I'm very pleased that you invested your time tonight uh, away from whatever else you had to do on a Monday night, and I'd like to make sure you get a good return on that investment. So why all the fuss about HTML5? A little bit of overview, kind of a high-level uh, talk on that. Who is using HTML5 in production currently? Anyone? Okay. And who is experimenting with it for eventual use at some point? Okay, so most people are either using it or will be using it. So it's an important thing. Then I'd like to talk about what we tried to do with, J with HTML5 and JSF 2.2. And then we'll have a little break from HTML5 technologies about resource library contracts. I wanted to really stay true to the agenda that we came up with, so that's why I have that in there. And then closing out with uh, two of the HTML5 associated push technologies, uh, event source and WebSocket. Um, okay, so my speaker qualifications. I've been involved with JSF for a, a very long time, and uh, I've had the pleasure of being the spec lead for a long time as well. And the most fun part of my job as the spec lead is to uh, integrate other people's great ideas into the core JSF specification so that the, the platform as a whole can grow. And um, I have lots of evidence to point to about how successful J uh, JSF has been and also how successful Java can be when we really take the best ideas from the community and put them in the platform in a way that makes sense. You know, uh, th that's really the art of what Sun and now Oracle has done with regard to evolving Java over time because it's, it's a, ser a very stable platform but yet we're continuing to bring new innovation out uh, to people. For example, uh, the Java SE8 Lambda expressions. Is anyone excited about that? Functional programming, yes. It's, it's, I think it's really cool, and I off, when I looked at it, I said to myself, my goodness, if we had Lambdas when we were writing JSF 1.0, it would be a very different thing indeed. Uh, Lambdas plus CDI, I can really imagine some really cool things you could do uh, for the web framework space. Uh, also, because I've been so close to JSF for so long, um, you know, I'm not an expert in applying JSF in practice, and that's why I love coming to these meetings, because you all are the experts in applying JSF. 
So um, during the questions and answers, you know, please go ahead and say whatever you'd like. And, uh, you know, because I am just working on the specification and this is how I get information to bring to the uh, next version. I've written a few books uh, for McGraw-Hill. I've got a couple of them here. Um, I'll be selling them tonight. I don't want to take them home. So this JSF 2.0 one I've got for 20 euros and the Hudson one I'm selling for 10. And, uh, you know, anyone using continuous integration at all? Very good to see that. Okay. Uh, Jenkins users? Okay. And Hudson users? All right. Bravo. Now, the uh, I was talking to uh, Marco, I think, on one of the uh, points of this today. And uh, the split between Hudson and Jenkins is not as much a technical thing as it is a uh, um, political thing, right? So the book focuses on Hudson, but almost all of the concepts can translate directly over. Now, this being a game company, I also uh, would like to say I'm a classic game fan, and uh, I have a little collection of classic games at home, uh, and uh, I had the honor of meeting David Crane, the author of Pitfall, once, and I got him to sign my manual there. And I also uh, maintain a fan site for this old Texas Instruments game, Tunnels of Dune. Has anyone ever played that game or heard of this game? No? Okay. TI-99, 1982. All right. Okay, so um, actually it's important to show this one because I'm going to be saying some opinion statements here. Um, I'm giving my opinion on uh, HTML5 and, and how it relates to the developer space. And uh, when I talk about specific technologies, I'm only talking about what Oracle has done. And what I'm saying here is, is my opinion. It's not indicative of what our future product directions are. Um, so I have to say that. So why all the fuss, right? Um, HTML5 has this page with all these logos, and I found this one up there. I've seen the future, it's in my browser. And they have all these little cute logos, and I thought then was, this one was kind of smug, right? So I decided to uh, take the JSF logo, because every technology needs a cute logo, right? And so we had, uh, a while ago, we had a contest to design uh, the JSF logo, and we had a number of people designing it, and uh, this one up the front here won. So I took it from the title slide and put it on this one here. Um, that's the Java Server Faces logo. Uh, so, you know, UI technology in the, uh, in the server, in the client, you know, we have a lot of questions about this. This is the big question, right? Where does the UI state go? And in the real world, there's going to be all of these things existing at the same time, right? So let's talk about what I mean by, you know, where does the UI state live? Let's talk about some classification. First, you have to realize that a web application is really a distributed application. And so if you look at it that way, you can apply all the principles from computer science that deal with the distributed applications should apply to JSF. So academically speaking, it's a distributed application because there are multiple computers with interactions between them and shared state among them. And today's production web apps are just really extremely complex distributed applications. I mean, the stuff that you guys are doing here at GameDuel is, you know, really complex, cutting edge, high number of transactions, high number of concurrent users, the kind of things that, you know, we couldn't do without a firm foundation of computer science underneath all of that. So why, why does that matter, right? Um, it's important to understand the history of things. So to understand the current state of web applications, we have to go back in the history of distributed applications and of the internet itself. So what we're trying to do when we build user interfaces, well, in fact, when we try to build distributed applications, we're trying to find the best um, allocation of processing tasks to processing nodes. So when you look at any distributed application, I assert that anything you possibly can do will fit into one of these buckets right here. You know, user interface, domain logic, application logic, data persistence, communication, reliability, security, everything. It's as if these are very high-level buckets that will contain everything. And each of those can be allocated to any of the nodes in your compute space. So what are we doing with the UI part, right? That's what we're trying to talk about here. Well, here's some facts about the user interface. Um, I assert that the UI is the hardest part to get right. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, and some of them are psychological and some of them are technical, 
and some of them are even economics based. So um, the technology for building UIs is changing very rapidly and will continue to change for the foreseeable future. We, we have all this churn in the UI space. If you look at the other um, bullet points on here, you know, I think object relational mapping is pretty well defined, pretty well understood. You're not seeing brand new ORM framework come out so much anymore. Um, you know, it could be argued that the big data type way of doing things with Hadoop and other things, they, they are changing the um, persistence space a little bit, but it's not as frequent as the churn that you get at the user interface layer. Uh, so I assert that the technology for the other aspects of the stack are, you know, less volatile and more mature. Another reason for this churn is that the major software stack and device vendors are competing on the basis of their UI technology. So they're trying to bring you to their platform, uh, whether it's a web framework um, or even a uh, full native platform, you know, the iOS or the Android or even maybe the Blackberry or, or Windows Phone, for example. Anyone doing Windows Phone development here? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's, a lot of there's a lot of churn in the UI space. So this is a little opinion graph that I made uh, showing the history of the UI for distributed applications. And it starts out way back in 1960. Uh, NCSA Mosaic wasn't the only important thing to come out of University of Illinois. Actually, the first graphical UI for a distributed system was at my alma mater, U of I, uh, called Play-Doh in 1960. And this represents the dumb terminal curve. And this curve had a really long run. You know, it started out here in 1960, and uh, I would say it had its peak in the late 80s. Uh, and as you know, there's still some of it, but it's mostly gone, right? Uh, the next thing that happened was uh, the bitmap display with a direct graphics API on a computer. So this is starting out with the X window system, Mac and PC. Windows 3.1. This is uh, what they would traditionally call a rich client application. Something where the software does not require a web browser to run. You write it and run it directly on the operating system. Uh, but it's not a mobile device. I'm, I'm putting this here as on computer because it requires some kind of computer connection, not a mobile device. Then there are sometimes these little historical accidents that happen and kind of don't pan out. So, um, you know, Gopher, Archie, Telnet, these used to be ways to do user interfaces for distributed applications. I don't know if anyone remembers any of these, but they did exist. And then along came uh, the browser. And this curve has had, you know, some ups and downs, but really uh, it's on the upswing. So at this point, I'd say that mobile native and browser are the two real important ways to do stuff. Now, that's just my opinion, right? This, this curve here could be up a little more with like Java FX and people still do swing applications. People do, still do uh, Windows OS applications. Um, but really as far as where all the growth and activity and excitement is, I would say it's either browser or mobile native. So let's talk about HTML5 then. So what's in a name, right? Um, let's rewind the clock again to 2006. Uh, does anyone here remember the fuss that happened with Ajax? Yeah? yeah, Ajax was a really big buzzword there. I mean, people would come to say, my goodness, you gotta give me Ajax. Can you buy me some Ajax, please? And, uh, you know, it was really an acronym, asynchronous JavaScript and XML HTTP request. And Ajax is a programming technique, not a single technology. It was something that Jesse James Garrett realized, hey, we could do this because XML HTTP request from Microsoft happens to be in all these different browsers now, and why don't we see if we can do that? And that sort of kicked it off. So when people say Ajax, they mean a programming technique. Uh, however, when people say HTML4, they really just mean markup, right? So that's IE6. It doesn't have very much to do with high-performance JavaScript, HTML4. You know, you have to use lots of browser tri tricks. And also, with HTML4-based apps, the use of native plugins is very common, right? So I'm contrasting HTML4 with Ajax because HTML4 is seen as a single technology. You know, it just doesn't have the buzz that HTML5 does because 
when people say HTML5, they really mean this big collection of all these other things. Uh, you know, the markup is the biggest piece in terms of um, lines of specification written, right? And uh, amount of code that it takes to implement that specification. But there's really so many other specifications out there. Okay. And uh, so it's important to realize that when people say HTML5, they really mean um, this collection of things. It's a, a marketing term, really. Uh, let's see. So really, is it a big deal? Um, uh, you know, Ajax came along, and it was just a programming technique. And yeah, it was kind of a big deal. But I assert that HTML5 really is indeed a big deal. And that is because of two things. First, the end of the browser wars. And that's related to the rise of Chrome. Uh, Google Chrome has become the most commonly used browser. And uh, the fact that you can now depend on this level of quality, and you know, this website like you know, caniuse.com will give you all these cross concerns. Um, that really has made it possible to do these kinds of things. And you, yes, so you can make the statement that standards have finally won, right? Now, I'm really glad that we can talk about standards tonight because Java Server Faces is an example of a standard, although it's a much smaller kind of slice of the information technology work uh, world than any of the things done by W3C or ECMA or IETF, right? I mean, JCP is a standards body, but it's very, uh, it's all focused on Java, right? So it's only dealing with that. Um, the way to measure your standards body is, you know, how inclusive is it, right? So if you look at the HTML5 specification, you can see on there Microsoft, Google, Apple, but on the core HTML5 markup, there really isn't a representation of Mozilla.org. And I think that represents some of the fractions that have happened, or factions that have happened over the years with, for example, uh, the WG and the W3C splitting off and then coming back. And uh, the point I'm trying to make is, when you say that standards have won, you also have to realize that standards are inclusive and representative. And uh, I think HTML5 is pretty good at that, but I would like to see you know, a little more, uh, you know, combination of uh, participation from Mozilla as well. But there's a lot of reasons for that not being the case. Another thing, a quick aside, um, is HTML5 a bloated specification? I've, I've heard this, not too much though, uh, this is one argument about that. Uh, or is Java EE or even JSF a bloated specification? And the answer is, well, I think you have to just look at so-called bloat as a measure of how long something has been around. Um, things just gather more uh, features over time. And if something is well used, then it will get bigger and bigger. And uh, so you could say that so-called bloat is actually uh, an indication of uh, age and how well used something is. OK, the final point I want to make this uh, about this is that a big deal thing. Um, I think we have to remember the uh, death of the browser plugin, and specifically Flash, right? This was a post that uh, Steve Jobs put up in April of 2010. And I would say that when I look back on the history of things, this was really the point where you could finally say, we don't need to worry so much about plugin-based browser development. Applets had already died as a, a, you know, a relevant platform for large-scale things, although there are some great applets out there that I use. And I personally think the technology is very good. Um, but it, as far as uh, having one in the marketplace, it's really hard to make a case that they have. Um, another thing is uh, when oh, Steve Jobs did this post, you know, that was indicative of their decision to not support Flash. And I think that was one of the things, that, and the rise of the iPhone, that kind of really pushed Flash aside from its uh, prior place on the top. But there's still some tension when it comes to developing user interfaces. That, that churn is still there. Even though standards have won, there's still um, a, a desire from the component vendors to have you take advantage of the power in the client. But as a software developer, you'd like to minimize the complexity of distributing and maintaining that software. So that's the challenge that we're still trying to uh, figure out. So to put this all in context, I assert that HTML5 is a marketing term that describes a way of building the UI for a distributed system. 
And so when we are developing UI for distributed apps, we really have to decide where we want to put this slider. And uh, with JSF, you know, it's right over here. With the HTML5 spec, you have it way over here. But in any application that's built in the real world, there's going to be a mix of these things, um, particularly now as we're in a transition phase. So, you know, in real life, you have your choice to where you want to put this slider. And what we hope to do with JSF and with Java EE now and in the future is make it uh, easier to develop applications that have the slider positioned in different places. So what we did with HTML5 uh, in JSF 2.2 is just the markup piece. There's a lot of other stuff, as I showed, but we only focused just on the markup piece. Uh, for the wider Java E7, there were two specific specification efforts, uh, WebSocket, which I will talk about specifically, and JSON, which I will not. Now, people often include JSON when they say HTML5, but uh, it's really not specified by the HTML5 spec. Um, it's related to the JavaScript spec, which is, again, done by ECMA, not W3C. And uh, that one is represented very well uh, with Mozilla.org, because it's led by Brendan Eich, who still is on Mozilla. Okay. So let's talk, about the, let's talk about the JSF 2.2 HTML5 friendly markup feature. Um, if you're new to JSF, has anyone used JSF before? Okay, good, good. Um, if you are new to JSF, I'm only talking about a small set of even what's new in JSF 2.2. There's a lot of other new features that I'm not talking about tonight. Uh, but if you are new to JSF, you can start by looking at 2.0. Don't look at anything prior to that. Um, that was really kind of the thing that we, um, with JSF 2.0, it was the do or die release. If we didn't fix things like adding Ajax, adding good support for uh, components and modularity, if we didn't add that, and facelets too, if we didn't add that in JSF 2.0, I wouldn't be here talking to you today, for sure. Um, but that's the most recent big blockbuster release. 2.2 is more of an incremental thing. We have some cool new features, but um, when you compare to like the, the big feature release, it was 2.0. So I wanted to uh, take this moment to uh, recognize one of our esteemed guests in the audience, my uh, colleague Frank Caputo. Frank, raise your hands. Frank came down from ha Hamburg. Frank is uh, one of the JSF expert group members that joined. Uh, and helped us work on JSF 2.2, and he um, was one of the main designers of the two features I'm talking about here tonight, HTML5 friendly markup and resource library contracts. And the reason I want to bring this up is I talked about the importance of standards bodies, right? Well, I really think that um, a standards body has to be inclusive of the community in order for it to be considered a success. And we have a proven track record in Java and in JSF in particular, for taking ideas from the community and putting them into the core platform. And JCP is uh, a community effort. So um, it's an open process. Anyone can join the JCP and uh, join the expert group and uh, make contributions right away. So you know, all of these people over the years have contributed in one way or another to uh, JSF, either directly or by working on the expert group or writing code. Um, it's a very big group of folks. OK. So there's two parts uh, to what we are doing with HTML5 in JSF. But in both cases, we wanted to stay true and basically do the same thing we do with every other new thing that comes along. Integrate the new thing into the core while staying true to the, new, the core strengths of the technology. And so there are two high-level areas of integration. The first, regarding the simple doc type, how we handle doc type. Uh, we've now specified that HTML5 doc type is the default. And then the more interesting thing are the markup changes. And uh, these can be characterized as two levels here. Get your hands off my markup, say, you know, the page developer saying that to JSF. And uh, this as it represents the differences between a page developer and a web developer. So getting into the doc type element, uh, as I mentioned, if you do nothing in JSF 2.2, it will automatically generate the HTML5 doc type. So if you put doc type transitional in there, 
and you don't say anything else, it's going to just say doc type HTML5. I'm just, it'll, it'll say doc type HTML, not HTML5, just HTML. If you would like to configure that away from the default, you can use this facelets processing um, syntax in the faces config file. And you can indicate for what file extension you'd like to process as. And the meaning of the process as is represented in this table here. Now, I'm going to put these slides up on SlideShare so you don't need to note it down. But this basically just says, for the different values of process as, how will you handle the doc type? Are you going to simplify it? Are you just going to pass it through? Are you going to consume it? Um, what are you going to do with the XML declaration? What are you going to do with processing instructions, C data? How are you going to handle inline text escaping and XML comments? So, you know, we gathered all the feedback from the expert group about what they wanted to see for these different options, and that's what's in this uh, table. So now the HTML5 friendly markup passing through, just passing through. Uh, okay, anyone out here familiar with Wicket or using Wicket? Okay, so I like to look at this feature as the best part of Wicket comes to JSF, and I believe that people tell me the best part of Wicket is the ability to just write pages in plain old HTML without having to use uh, all these funny tags, right? They might even say, oh, I don't have to use any namespaces at all. Well, that's almost true with this. The only thing you have to use is one namespace. And uh, this one namespace here is this new one that we have for all the Java E7 specifications, xmlns.jcp.org. Uh, Java.sun.com namespaces will still work. You can use either one. Uh, but this is the uh, one that we specified for E7, the one that we will use going forward. And this, is, again, is another statement of um, commitment to the community. We weren't going to just go ahead and global search and replace java.sun.com with java.oracle.com. That wouldn't work very well. So going with the community, it's jcp.org. So what you do is you uh, tag any of the input, I'm sorry, any of the elements with uh, a s one or more attributes from this namespace will cause JSF to perform a, a mapping operation so that these things are represented on the server side like they are really the old h colon components. Um, but on the markup side, um, it r looks just like this. And the markup is passed through directly to the uh, browser. So that's the nice thing. That's get your hands off my markup. So let's go back to basics about what we do with views in JSF 2.2. JSF views have always been written uh, in a view declaration language. The first one we had was JSP, and then we added facelets. And this one here is still facelets, but it's, uh, it's leveraging just the fact that facelets is XML. Um, and the facelet VDL is composed of two kinds of elements, either HTML markup or JSF components. And, uh, in the case of markup, it's passed straight through to the browser. And in the case of components, they take some action on the server during the lifecycle. So with these two categories of elements, before JSF 2.2, the model we had was, let's be friendly for the page, de page developer. Uh, the page developer is someone who just wants to do a UI. They really may not have a deep level of HTML, CSS, JavaScript skill. They would like to build their UI. So they, they don't, you know, HTML doesn't have a calendar component, or at least HTML4 doesn't. So um, you would have a custom component that would render this here. And this is fine for the page developer, but the web developer, when they see this, they're like, you know what, I really would like to write my own calendar component, or I would like to use, um, you know, jQuery UI or something like that. And then certainly you can do that with, uh, before JSF 2.2, uh, otherwise, like prime faces wouldn't work at all. Anyone using prime faces here? So prime faces use a lot uses a lot of uh, jQuery UI, uh, even before JSF 2.2. Uh, but it makes it even easier with this feature at the application level. So um, in JSF 2.2, it kind of turns that around. Rather than using the tags to hide the HTML, we let the elegance of the HTML shine through. So this, you can have pure HTML script CSS images in the JSF page, and the JSF renderer 
just handles what happens on the postback or, or the get, you know, the request processing portion of it. So it leverages the strength of the JSF lifecycle, which is in very concise way specified by saying, hey, you know, look at this. It's an EL expression. You can put it right there in the HTML page, and it just does the right thing. When you render the page, it does a get. When you post back to the page or, or get back to the page, it does uh, a set. And uh, that's really the core strength of JSF is what it does on the server side on the request processing. So with this thing, if you have a new feature in the browser, you don't have to wait for the new version of Prime Faces to come out that wraps that element, or you don't, or you don't have to wait for us, you know, the spec to revise itself to add a new um, uh, radio button or a new uh, input element. Um, you can just take advantage of these new markup features using pass-through elements. So that's one piece. The other piece is what I would call pass-through attributes. These are for when you have existing JSF pages, but you'd like to decorate them with some uh, HTML5 attributes, such as the data star attributes. So there's two ways of doing that. Uh, the first is just the traditional nest a thing inside of a component. And so the first is this plural f colon pass through attributes. There you're uh, saying this thing is a map, and I would like every value in this map to be rendered as a name value pair on the enclosing element. The other approach with the nesting is just a single name value pair. And uh, that will cause the markup to be rendered there. The final approach for pass through attributes is um, the uh, namespace approach. So here you're declaring another namespace. This is different from the previous one. The previous one I'll show, it was, where is that? Yes, this is xmlnsjcp.org slash JSF. And for the pass through attribute case, it is xmlns.org slash JSF slash pass through. So you if you just call in any attribute from that namespace, it'll be rendered whatever name value pair you have here. So this would say placeholder equals enter email. Okay. So let's get into a demo of this. Let's hope the resolution works. Okay, good. Uh, can everyone see this okay? In the back? All right, thank you. All right, so the first thing I wanted to show, this is the, the page, right? And the nice thing about it is, even though this is appearing like plain old markup, you can still use any of the uh, advanced JSF things, such as F colon Ajax, or you could use validators, converters, value change listeners. All of the attached objects will still work because, in fact, what this does is it looks at a, a, a data structure on the server that knows how to map from the element name plus some collection of the attributes and turns that into one of the uh, h colon tags. Because there is an h colon tag for every primitive HTML element that we have. And for those that don't match, it just lets the markup pass through, uh, you know, with some kind of generic renderer for that. So we didn't have to add a progress bar component to HTML, uh, but yet you can still use it uh, just fine from the markup here. Um, the JSF mechanism that does this, here's Frank, I had to grab his picture. Um, the the uh, JSF thing that enables this is, there it is, the tag decorator thing. Tag decorator. Here it is. So this is the Java doc here. The reason this funny color coding is here is if you go to jsf.java.net and look at the Java docs as opposed to going to like docs.oracle.com, you'll get the uh, color coding that shows what's new and changed and, and added and removed in each version of the specification. So here, this is that table I was talking about. Look at the element name plus some selector attributes, and you turn it into this. And then there's some text at the bottom that says, if no match is found, then let it be one of these things. So that's you know, the mechanism of how this works. 
So this is what I what the page looks like if I just render it with a file colon URL. And that's kind of nice. And then if you render it on the server, it looks a little bit nicer. And so I'll type in some values here. And you notice that it upgraded, it updated the progress bar as I'm typing through. If I type some text here, uh, uh, it updates even further. One, two, three, four, five. And if I type in some text here, uh, it shows me a red box on here, um, which is not quite correct. It says, please enter an email address. This is the browser's native uh, validation. So even though I didn't specify anything about a validator here, there is uh, a part of the HTML5 spec that says um, if the type is input type equals email, then you, know, you should perform some semantic validation on the thing. Uh, and if I change it to a prop or something that does validate as an email, then you know that will work. So the nice thing is I was able to uh, demonstrate how you can still have all the power of uh, JSF 2.0. Um, for example, you'll notice there's clearly some JavaScript happening in this page, but there's no, there's no JavaScript here. That's because the F colon Ajax tag uh, automatically handles that JavaScript for you. Okay. And then uh, let's look at the same thing in Chrome. Uh, see how that looks there. Looks renders slightly differently when you do it as a file colon URL. Renders even different still when you render it um, this way. I'm not sure why that progress is underneath the uh, text. But the uh, functionality is still the same. Yep. Interestingly, though, uh, I don't think Chrome's email validation is, is the same as... Uh, Firefox's. It didn't give me any indicator there. So that was didn't work right. But that's one of the browser differences. So the reason I bring this up is it's a question of responsibility. If you can say to the guy who wrote your H colon calendar picker, you got to make this thing work in all the different browsers, then it's that guy's problem. The moment you take the reins yourself and say, I'm going to be the one that writes all the HTML, you're taking it on yourself. So, you know, that's something you have to be aware of with the pre-JSF 2.2 way of doing things. There was a separation of concerns, and now uh, it's becoming more and more mixed. But I assert that's less of a problem now because HTML development skills um, are much more widespread than they were 10 years ago. More and more people know how to do it. The state of the art is kind of advanced. You can really assume a higher level of competence in HTML developers now than you could have uh, six years ago or so. Okay, next up, um, this non-HTML5 interlude, and let's pick up the pace a bit. Oh, I clicked start from beginning. I hate when I do that. That's not what I want to do at all. Go. Play some current slide. Okay, so for those of you that are using JSF, um, have you used facelets at all? Yep, okay. So this feature t totally builds on top of facelets, right? So with facelets, you have um, a few moving parts. The first moving part is what's called the template client. This is the actual text, you know, that you want to display in where the real content is. Then you, on top of that, have a template that has some holes in it where the real content goes. And it might, you know, have some different sidebars. And you could use a number of different templates with the same template client and uh, change how things are arranged in the page. But really, what that is, is um, some, some pieces of data. You have the template file name. You have the names of the insertion points. And then you have these resources that are in here. You know, for example, there must be a style sheet behind this because it's rendering this with a different font. Uh, this nice kind of uh, italics font. So what that is, you can look at that as a contract. A contract complains, oops, contains uh, the, the declared templates, the declared insertion points, and the, de the declared resources. So once you now have a contract, you can say that every facelet page is, in fact, a contract with these elements in it. Let's formalize that a bit, but not too much and declare where we can load these contracts from. 
So in JSF 2.2, we added yet another special directory. We have a lot of special directories in JSF because Rails does it, so it must be okay. Um, the, in this one, contracts, right? So here you have all the different contracts that apply to the application, contract A, B, C. Also, you can package these things in jar files and WebInf Live. So we have some more contracts here, D, E, F. And uh, this comprises the set of available contracts in your application. Now, what this means is that any of these contracts is now available as a template from any page in your app. So you could just say, you know, UI uh, composition and list the names of any of these guys and it will automatically be found there. So any of the facelet pages can use any of these contracts. Now, if you'd like to constrain the set or the mappings between contracts and pages, <coughs> then you can do so with syntax in the faceless config file. There's also uh, a way to specify explicitly on a facelet page which contracts you would like to have available. So that's not just, um, you know, you have to have a UI facelet code inside of here that's going to actually use it, but this says, okay, um, facelet here can take advantage of any of the contracts that are in contract A. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about that. Now we'll talk about the HTML5 push technologies. There are two that are in HTML5, and then there's a third that, well actually a third or fourth, you could say comet and long polling are two other approaches for doing uh, push, but neither of those are actually in the core HTML5 spec, so I'm not gonna mention that. But both event source, which is known as server sent event, and WebSocket are. Uh, okay, so what's the difference between server sent events and WebSockets? Uh, WebSocket allows full duplex communication, server sent events does not. WebSocket has an IETF protocol in the middle, uh, server sent events does not. Uh, both interact with JavaScript via a W3C standard API. Um, event source in the case of SSE and WebSocket in the case of WebSocket. Uh, they both allow updating, uh, allow the server to update the client. So that in both cases, the server can send new things down to the client. They both run over HTTP proxy really well. Um, unfortunately, event source is not supported on Internet Explorer at all, although there is a polyfill meaning uh, a way to kind of work around a browser uh, shortcoming uh, using JavaScript usually. So let's take a look first at a demo of the uh, event source in JSF. I hope the demo works. All right. So uh, this is a, a page that's using server sent events to send uh, some stock information down. So let's put in a ticker here and choose get quotes. And then you'll see that uh, this is going to start to update. This isn't real live data, so uh, but it is pushing the data down. And we can show here, um, add another one. And we're going to see another row there. And we can click this here to get news on these different stocks that we've selected here. And, uh, none of this is causing full page refresh, but this is all um, showing server sent events that are happening um, uh, coming from the server to the browser. So let's take a look at how this is implemented. Here's JSF stocks. And let's look at the main index page. Oh, that's, that's the index HTML. It just does the meta refresh. I want the stock page. So this one uses a, an a, a JSF 2.0 composite component to uh, declare that I would like to have uh, this SSE. So let's take a look at this, what this composite component does. It um, just does jsf.sse.connect, which is a JavaScript function that is present in this file right here, jsf.sse.js. So the nice thing is, in the page, we don't need to see any JavaScript. 
but we're just able to use this uh, server sent event composite component to render that out. So let's look inside the connect. Okay, so um, we call through to this get event source method, which does new event source on the URL. And then uh, once we have the event source, uh, which has been assigned to a local variable there, uh, we add on event, and then this is passing in the event options that we have. So this demo is, um, the source code for it is available in the JSF uh, repository. Um, and I'm going to put these slides up on SlideShare, so you'll be able to get that there. Um, this is actually a rather old um, demo that I got <coughs> from my colleague Roger Katane, uh, but it does get the point across about server sent events pretty well. So once the uh, add on event is called, then we are able to receive the updates and update the different regions in the page from the server. So let's see if we can find out where that is. Doc.xhtml, there we are. Uh, right, so we have this other composite components here, easy clock and easy stock monitor and easy RSS that uh, take the data that has come back from the uh, server sent event and display it. Um, so this here is, uh, you know, just using the J uh, Ajax to update when you do a new stock ticker symbol. And uh, then here, this is the table, right? So this is a placeholder table that gets overwritten by the uh, um, markup that's in this file here, app.js. So let's take a look at app.js. Okay, so here, this is where we're, um, you know, handling the uh, server side stuff and building the table up there. So it's a pretty simple demo, but it gets the point across. The server is sending data, and we're continuing to update it as we go along. Okay, I have another demo that shows uh, the HTML5 Canvas component in action. And so this one here, um, this is just a HTML5 Canvas. So if I view source, uh, you will see there's Canvas there. So we have a bunch of JavaScript that is rendering this little matrix here using the HTML5 Canvas. And uh, it gets updated uh, based on the values I click over here. So let's, uh, first we'll pick a color, dark blue, and we'll just put a few pixels on here. I guess that was actually green. That. So um, I have another browser window up that shows this in Chrome. And you can see that as I click things here, they get updated over there. Let me move this over. Move this over here. There we go. So let's change the color to red. And then we'll use this little this is just the HTML5 color picker. You can see it's rendered differently in Firefox versus Chrome. <coughs> so um, it's just using servers, it's using uh, web sockets to um, update as uh, it goes along. Close this. Okay. And changes I make over here are reflected uh, over there. So let's take a look at how this works in the code. A lot of files. I'm going to close. The matrix control. So let's look at the main page. And it's a similar pattern. Um, you have this composite component that renders a web socket instead of an, a server sent event. And it has a JavaScript function that takes the values that are passed in the channels, the host name, and the port. Uh, the only one that's required is the channels attribute. And there we pass it through the JavaScript function. And uh, here you can see the pattern where you take a, you know, using the JavaScript API, you say new WebSocket, and then you uh, assign some uh, function handlers here in JavaScript on open on message. And uh, this code here, uh, process message, deals with what comes in from the server side. 
So there's a server side uh, piece that's just not present in uh, server sent events that is a part of the uh, Java EE standard. So I'll show you that real quick because we're out of time. Uh, but it's really, really nice and simple. You can have any old POJO and you can annotate it with at server endpoint. And this will now become uh, the other side of a WLS, I'm sorry, of a WS colon slash slash URL. That's the scheme for WebSockets defined by the IETF standard. And so it's going to s reside on the server by default, the same server that JSF is running on. But that can be configurable. You can run the, the WebSocket endpoint on any other host. Uh, that's one of the things that's a little bit scary, I think, about the WebSocket thing is that you can connect from any host. So um, I, I think it needs to be looked at security-wise because you have this concept of the cross-site scripting attack. So if you have a combination of cross-site scripting plus the fact that you can open up, that any JavaScript code can now open up a WebSocket to any server anywhere, there's no sandboxing, no restriction, uh, that's a little bit worrisome to me. So uh, I have a challenge to you all. I put a question on Stack Overflow last night about this, uh, about the security implications of allowing a uh, WebSocket to connect to servers other than the origin server from which the script was loaded. And uh, I would like you please to, you know, anyone use Stack Overflow here? I'm sure that everyone does, right? Uh, what a site that is. It's like, you know, what, what um, Wikipedia did for students writing school papers, Stack Overflow did for software developers, I think. So um, uh, anyhow, I, I would like to see some uh, answers to that question about the security constraints because I was always, you know, I mentioned applets, right? I like applets because of the difficulty of securities. We put so much effort into it, although there have been so many high-profile security problems over the years. Um, it's just because, you know, a lot of people are hacking on it because it's, uh, it's a popular attack vector, but we have signed applets, we have all these eff efforts, the, the sandbox to try to make things more and more secure. And uh, no one seems to care about the security uh, the implications of this on the JavaScript side. So hopefully that's going to get fixed. I don't really know what the state of the art is. But coming back to that, um, you can run this thing by saying at server endpoint, and then you just annotate your methods uh, on open, on close. These will get called here. So Let's just, you know, since we are developers, uh, let's try setting a breakpoint on this uh, on open. So I will uh, close the browser and actually, let me do it this way. Close my other tabs and close this. Leave the page here. Let's just uh, say nothing there cookies. I just want to get rid of the cookies. Yeah, let's make sure there's nothing remembered about this. Okay, this, and I think I want to change this to localhost, because that's where I deleted the cookies. Okay, you see my breakpoint was hit for the on open. So uh, what we're doing is adding to the list of peers. Now, I think peers should have two in it, because that um, Chrome's guy is still connected. So this appears, oh, it's size one. So that one must have closed. No, but it was the previous, oh, did I? Yeah, I did. Oh, maybe because of localhost, perhaps. Oh, there's the peer. So now peer should be two. Oh, it hasn't been added yet. That's the point. Right, now it's two. Okay. Okay. Um, one other quick thing is Sometimes people, well, you'll note that this session object is passed here. This has nothing to do with the HTTP session. This is just a Java WebSocket session, and every, it's, you know, it's related to that specific thing. You can still get access to the HTTP session, though. Um, if you pass in this configurator attribute here, you'll get uh, called with this modify handshake element, or uh, annotation, I'm sorry, callback, because you're extending configurator. And uh, that is where you can ask the um, request to get the HTTP session. So if you want, like to um, integrate with other elements of the servlet spec, uh, you can do that. So there's a lot more to uh, WebSocket than I have the time to talk about here today. But I think we only allocated uh, one hour. 
Um, so I'd like to uh, move it over to questions and answers. Uh, is that right? We had one hour? Yes. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention.